Hello, I'm Eric Vanman, and I'm going ahead and giving you a presentation about some of my writing tips uh, when you're writing a paper for a psychology course or for an honors thesis. Some of these things would also would apply uh, for writing a manuscript that you'd be submitting to a journal. Although if it is actually a manuscript being submitted to a journal, there would be some extra things that you would need to consider. So I recommend that you be sure you consult the APA style manual before you do that. Anyway, this was this presentation was recorded in April of 2020, and the seventh edition of the APA publication manual had been out for a couple months at that time, and so these tips are trying to incorporate some of the changes that are in the seventh edition. I have some just general writing tips that I want to begin with, and then I'll move into more about APA style. Um, it is actually part of the APA manual that they talk consistently throughout the, the um, manual that they would like you to try to write uh, as clearly as possible. So that's, it's, it can't be said enough that the main goal of writing should be to be clear about the message that you're trying to convey, that your structure is crucial. And I won't be really talking about structure very much in this presentation, but anytime you write an essay or a report, the structure of your arguments and how you're making your points is, should be thought out in advance. You should try to use the first person point of view um, you don't have to always use the word I. You could write the sentences in a different way, so you don't have to use the word I. But the point is, is that you are the author, or you and some other people are the author, so you should use I or we appropriately to convey that you are the author. And it's completely acceptable in APA style to be using the, the word I and, and to write things in the first person point of view. Uh, use the active voice. And this is a, an important point that a lot of people have learned to kind of write in this passive voice style that makes it sound more scientific, I guess. But using the active style, again, is a clear way of writing. It kind of clearly tells us who did what to whom. And so we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And try to write short and clear sentences. That, and this will help you avoid long, confusing constructions. I've marked papers over the years from students that sometimes a sentence actually went along the entire length of a page. It was like a very long paragraph, just one long sentence with lots of qualifiers. Not acceptable in a psychology paper. You should really be working on short, crisp sentences. And then be sure you read, rewrite, and read again. And this is one of the reasons why we always try to get students to uh, write their assignments well before their deadline so they have a chance to rewrite it and maybe even give it someone else to read to give them feedback about their writing, some obvious spelling mistakes or grammar, or whatever it happens to be. But rewriting and revising is, is always important no matter how good of a writer you are. And if you cut that off, you just go ahead and write one draft and that's what you turn in, you're putting yourself in jeopardy of having a lot of marks taken away and not having your readers understand what exactly you're trying to convey. So what is the APA and what is APA style? Well, the APA stands for the American Psychological Association. It's the world's largest association of psychology researchers and clinicians and other practitioners. And long ago, the APA created a citation style that, they, uh, that has become commonly used uh, for formatting for manuscripts in the social sciences. So it's not just people in psychology that use it. You also find it in a lot of other fields as well. It's published these citation styles is published in the APA publication manual. And the manual not only talks about referencing, but it also talks about stylistics, about how to, again, write in a more effective writing style. It talks about how to use in-text citations. And it also talks about, of course, how you should properly uh, report your references. So, so in terms of stylistics, some important things to keep in mind is that you can use personal pronouns where appropriate. And you should try to use the first person rather than the third person when describing the work that you did or when expressing your views. So again, it's okay to say things like, I, my opinion is, or I collected the data for this, I conducted this analysis. If you did all the writing yourself and you did whatever activity it was, you are the sole author, then use the pronoun I and not we. So don't use some sort of royal we when it's really just you whose opinion you're expressing. And don't refer to yourself in the third person either. So don't try to hide the I by saying the author believes this when you're clearly the only author. You should say I. So again, this is all in the APA manual. It's strongly encouraged. It makes a better, crisper writing style. So whatever you might have been taught in the past about how unscientific it was to use the word I, 
is completely wrong, or at least it's not appropriate when we're talking about writing for psychology. You should also, again, use the active voice instead of the passive voice. So for instance, and you might try saying something like, we ask participants questions versus the participants have been asked questions by the researchers. So you can see then the researchers are the authors of this paper. So we can say we instead of the researchers because it's just masking who we are. So we've turned it around into an active voice construction where there's a clear su subject, there's a clear verb, and there's a clear object for that verb. So in terms of language, as I've said now a few times, you want to be clear and specific in your writing. You should try to avoid jargon, even if it's for a psychology audience. That is, um, a lot of people who read your paper for a class or an essay or uh, an honors thesis or even a manuscript that you submit to a journal, a lot of those people won't know the jargon of that particular topic that you're writing about. And so you should try to avoid specialized terms as much as you can, avoid acronyms if you can, and so on. You should also try to avoid contractions. So instead of saying can't or don't, you would say cannot or do not. Um, and this is to give the writing some more formal structure, formal writing. Um, and so contractions are actually uh, sort of frowned upon in the APA manual. So if you can avoid them, do so. And try to avoid colloquialisms. That is, try not to talk the way you might talk with a friend. Um, there is a certain sort of solemnity to the way you write something in a psychology paper. I'm not trying to say you have to write again in a very pondering, uh, big word kind of phrases. I'm really just saying try to avoid little terms that you might use when you're just being colloquial with friends. When you're writing an essay, you should try to type and double space it to be printed on standardized paper. I know a lot of people now write uh, things that don't even get printed on paper, but at least pick the A4 formatting. Um, that's important here in Australia. Um, keep in mind that if you submit your manuscript to a, a journal that's actually published in the American, um, in a, an American publisher, they will actually be expecting eight and a half by 11, which is actually smaller than A4. And so at that point, you'd want to go up and do, when you're formatting your document, to pick it to be eight and a half by 11 so you can make sure that things actually appear properly when they get printed out in some American's um, paper. Uh, use two and a half centimeter margins on all the sides. Use a 12 point font, you know, like Times New Roman is perfectly fine or something similar, nothing, you know, fancy or um, unusual looking. Include a page number in the upper right hand side of every page. No running head is needed now. And note that if you are writing a manuscript draft, APA suggests using just one space between sentences. You might find that you're going ahead and writing an essay for class that you feel still comfortable putting two spaces between each end of the sentence punctuation. Uh, the APA manual now suggests that you just use one space between sentences. Here's an example of a title page. And you can see that one of the things that happened in the seventh edition is they've now gotten rid of running heads for student papers. It's different when we're talking again about a journal manuscript, but at least when you're writing something for a course, you don't have a running head. So the only thing you should have on the front page in the upper right corner is just the page number. And for a title page, you title it the first page number, sorry, the title page is the first page. So it should have a one because it's page one. Then you see how I put the title. The title should be in the upper half of the page. It should be centered and in a bold face. And then underneath it, you can put your name, your affiliation, your course, your instructor, your lecturer, and the date that this assignment was due. In the main body of the text, you can see that right away I've gone to the second page here. There was no abstract from this essay because it's not a report. So I didn't write an essay, but you can see that there's a two there on the upper right corner because I'm now on page two of this manuscript. It's a different manuscript, by the way, from the one that was on the title page. And it says here that you should number the first text page as page number two, type and center the title of the paper uh, right in the center there and use bold phase at the top of the page. Type the next, um, sentences and everything else from that point on double spaced with all the sections following each other without a break. Identify the sources that you use in the paper and parenthetical in-text citations and use proper formats for tables and figures. Now the reference pages. 
reference page um, starts like this. And you can see again, we centered the title here, the word references, at the top of the page, and use bold face. Double space all of the reference entry, entries. You can see everything is double spaced everywhere, but there's no extra space between each entry. Use italics for any book and journal titles. Provide the volume number and the issue number. And for the volume number, you should put the uh, volume number in italics. Flush left the first line of each entry and then indent the subsequent lines. Order these entries alphabetically by the author's surnames. And now in the seventh edition, it's recommended or required, depending on how you want to look at it, that you should provide the DOI numbers for each um, thing that you cite, each paper or journal, uh, journal article or book. And you should use the format of the link, the URL, the HTTPS, uh, doi.org. Um, and then put the rest of the citation in there. So you can see my examples, I have that. So the APA is recommending that we have direct links to the DOI rather than having to take a DOI number and type it into some third party and figure out where the actual article is. So this gives us a direct link to the actual article. Now in text, when you're doing citations, this helps the readers locate the cited source in the reference section of the paper. So keep that in mind, that's what you're doing this for. So whenever you use a source, you want to provide in brackets and parentheses the author's name and the date of the publication. And when you have quotations or close paraphrases, not only should you provide the author's name, the date of the publication, but should also provide a page number. When you're quoting, introduce the quotation with a signal phrase to so make sure that you include the author's name, the year of the publication, the page number. But keep the citation brief, don't repeat information. So you can see here, I've got two examples where I have here, Carruth 1996 stated that a traumatic response frequently entails a quote, and here's my quotation that I'm getting directly from Carruth 1996, and then close quote, and then I have brackets, page 11, close brackets. In the other example, what I've done is I'm not really emphasizing that it was Carruth, I'm just going ahead and saying a traumatic response frequently entails a quote, delayed uncontrolled repetitive appearance. And then I, in brackets, go ahead and give my citation, Carruth, comma, 1996, comma, page 11. Either one of these is appropriate. Stylistically, the first example is trying to emphasize it was Carruth that made this statement. The second one doesn't really uh, worry so much that it was Carruth. It's just trying to make the point about what a traumatic response is. So it just depends on what your uh, goal is in writing that particular sentence. You want to include the author's name in a signal phrase followed by the year of the publication in parentheses. So you can see here in these examples, I have here like Higginot et al. 1987, Marcus 1989, Rate and Tate, and so on. When including the quotation in a summary paraphrase, also provide a page number in the parentheses after the quotation. Sorry. When the parenthetical citation includes two or more works, order them in the same way they appear in the reference list. The author's name, the year of the publication, separated by a semicolon. So here I wanted to end my sentence by citing two different papers, one by Katschru and one by Smith. So I'm going ahead and mentioning them both in the brackets and then just separate, separating the entries with a semicolon. When citing a work with two authors, use and in between the author's names and the signal phrase, yet use an ampersand between their names when they're in brackets or parentheses. So for instance, here we have, according to feminist researchers, Rate and Tate. So you can see here I have the word and appear because I'm not in brackets. But below that, I have another example where I say some feminist researchers question that, quote, women's responses to the war have been, been ignored, unquote. Then I have brackets, Rate and with an ampersand, Tate. So the ampersand, the shorter version of the word and, you know, the shortened version, of and is what you use in the brackets. So use the ampersand there, but in the main body, when I'm just going ahead and saying rate and tate like I do in the previous example, I actually write out the word and. Now, this is something new in the seventh edition. When you're citing a work with three and more authors, identify the first author's name followed by et al. So it used to be that you would actually mention up to six authors' names the first time you cited the paper. Now it's just the convention in the seventh edition that you should go ahead and use et al. as soon as you get to three or more authors and just use et al. for everything. When you're citing authors with the same last names, use initials with their last names. So if I happen to have two citations for somebody named Katru, but one was B Katru and the other one's Y Katru, then I'm gonna go ahead and use the first initials, even though I'm in the actual text. 
when citing two or more works by the same author published in the same year, use a lowercase letter like A or B or C with the year of the publication in the order that they occur in the references. So here is Smith's 1998A, Study of Adolescent Immigrants. That means that in this paper that I'm writing, I might have two or three papers written by Smith in 1998. And so in order for the reader to know which of those two or three papers I'm talking about in the reference section, I'm using an A for the first mention of this, the B and the, sec and the C. So in the reference list, I should see the A one come first, then the B, and then the C one. So that's enough about some of the actual stuff that's in the APA manual. Now I want to go ahead and talk about some common writing problems that I've observed over the years when marking students' papers. Um, probably one of the most common ones that I see is the use of however. It's not used appropriately most of the time when someone writes the word however. So you should probably get trained in this, that if you find yourself writing the word however, stop and look at it again, because chances are, unless you're really good at this now, you probably are using it incorrectly. It's an adverb, and that means that it qualifies a group of words that precedes it. So you're going to try to do this to introduce a statement that contrasts with or seems to contradict something that has been said previously. So maybe what happened in the previous sentence was, people tend to put on weight in middle age, full stop. However, comma, gaining weight is not inevitable. So the however is saying, look, I'm about to say something that maybe contradicts the previous sentence, and then I say what that is afterwards, gaining weight is not inevitable. And you notice that it's a brand new sentence, a second sentence here. So I had a full stop after the first assertion, then however began the second sentence, and I used a comma there to use as an offset, and then saying what the actual uh, qualifier is. The thing that I see happen a lot when I'm marking assignments is that people try to use however just to stitch together two independent clauses or two independent sentences. So this is not the correct way to do it. Like here it says, I like cognitive behavioral therapy, comma, however I have never been trained in its methods. No, the way that you'd want to fix that one is to go ahead and add end the first phrase with a full stop. So you change it to I like cognitive behavioral therapy, full stop. However, capital H, comma, I have never been trained in its methods. Then you'd be doing it correctly. You'd be showing how you're using the second sentence to qualify the first sentence, and you're not just trying to stitch together two independent clauses. The use of et al. Now, et al. is actually an abbreviation. And the reason why that's important, so the actual full uh, thing is et ali, A-L-I-I. -I, so you can see that there. Um, and what we're doing is we're actually abbreviating et ali just to et al or at al. So there has to be a full stop after the L to indicate that it is an abbreviation. So that's why it's we have a full stop there, is that there should always be a full stop after the L in at all. That versus which. Again, this is one of those things where people kind of commonly make this mistake and they're probably not aware of it. But you want to use that when you're trying to, again, um, use it like an adverb to explain something. So we applied electrodes that fastened to the face. And so you can see I don't use a comma there. I'm just trying to say that the electrodes are fastened to the face. So I say that, right? I don't want to put which. I want to say which for qualifying dependent clauses like you see in the next example. So over the past several decades, the contact hypothesis comma, which pauses that interactions between blah, blah, blah. So the which you see I have there is setting off after that comma that precedes it, a clause or a phrase there that actually is describing the thing that had just occurred before it. So I'm using it in a different way than I'm using it above. In fact, I might even continue on with a comma at the end of this phrase and then continue with, and with my sentence. Um, so which usually is followed, uh, follows a comma when you see it used correctly. There are some exceptions to this. It's not all hard and fast, but you might want to look into that if you don't really, um, you weren't really aware of this issue before. Try to avoid long sentences. Again, it's a bad habit. I think that they teach you this back in high school that maybe it sounds more scientific or more erudite that you write super long sentences. No one likes to read long sentences. Why write a long sentence that you could instead shorten into several shorter sentences? Now, this is some language things that happen depending on whether or not English is your native language, and I just want to go ahead and highlight some of these. So research is a singular noun, so we don't usually say researches in this area, okay? So we usually say research and just use that as a singular noun. 
researchers are people, so that would be plural. Studies is a plural, so you could say studies in this area instead of researches. Um, so it might sound like those are the same thing, but studies or papers, those can be plural, but research is usually a singular noun. Same thing with the literature. We don't usually say the literatures. We don't usually use a plural form of that. So you might say the literature is unclear on this point. Now tense is another troublesome matter for a lot of people writing their papers in psychology. You should always use the past tense when you're describing what people have written or done in the past. So it could be Milgram conducted a study or Milgram 1967 concluded that because Milgram did this years and years ago, so it's in the past tense. Vanman, 2013, argued that. Now, what a lot of people would do is they might say Vanman, 2013, argues that. Well, I'm not arguing it right now. That happened back in 2013, so it's clearly in the past, so that's why you should use the past tense. You can use the present tense sometimes for things that are facts or general truths. So you say something like self-esteem is the basis of happiness, or the ACC sends input to the DLPFC. Here's an interesting question that I sometimes get into problems with with my colleagues. This is my opinion on this matter, okay? And the question is, can you cite studies without reading them? My answer to this is yes, because the studies themselves are our evidence in psychology. I do highly recommend that anything that you cite in your paper is something that you have personally read and you've checked on for the facts. But sometimes this isn't always necessary. Sometimes it might be something that you read about a long time ago, um, or it's just not possible because you can't get a copy of it. But still, because it's like the Milgram 1957 paper or whatever it happens to be, um, I still think it's important to make the proper citation. Don't be fooled in thinking that you should say, uh, as cited by, just because you didn't read it, because maybe somebody else mentioned that article. That other person may not have read it either. So again, I would try to look it up if you can, but if you can't, um, and it's something that's, like a, for instance, a well-known paper, I don't really find any um, justification for why you need to go actually read it yourself. Sexist language. Now, this is something that's new from the seventh edition. The seventh edition now recommends that you always use the singular they to refer to a person who uses they as their pronoun. But you should also use they as a generic third person singular pronoun now to refer to a person whose gender is unknown or it's irrelevant to the context of the usage. So this is something that has taken many decades to kind of undo in the sense that we were taught for a long time that you should use he or she um, to not use they when we're talking about one person because it's a plural, but now we're calling it the third person singular. And there are ways to write this, and you can say things like each participant turned in their questionnaire. That's now acceptable in APA. In fact, they would prefer that instead of you saying each participant turned in he or his or her questionnaire. The argument that they use in the seventh edition is that saying things like he or she makes it sound like there's only the binary choice in gender. And so they don't want to have that stated explicitly. So it's better to go ahead and use a generic third person singular pronoun. You can also just try to rewrite the sentence to use everything in a plural form. So, for example, instead of just saying the therapist, uh, a therapist uh, would like his or her client, you could say therapists who are too much like their clients can lose their objectivity. So I've just taken something that maybe was a singular noun, like therapist, and then I have to worry about using the they or um, and making it sound odd. I could go ahead and instead rewrite it so it's just all a plural form. Indenting and spacing. Now, this is a clear message I want to say to you that every single aspect of your paper should be double spaced. This is an old convention that goes to back to when people would actually want to have a copy, a hard copy to be able to write notes and to be able to indicate corrections and so on on the manuscript. And so even to this day, we still like to, for instance, if you use Turnitin or something to upload your assignment, we like having this extra space there because it gives us places to stick our comments in. So double spaced everywhere. The references are double spaced. They shouldn't be single spaced. There should be no extra space between the paragraphs. This is sort of a default that's on MS Word. So if you use Microsoft Word, you need to figure out how to turn off that extra spacing between paragraphs. There shouldn't be three lines between each paragraph. It should just be the same spacing that you see in any other line. 
The start of each paragraph should be indented. Five spaces is good, but you could also use three spaces. Left justification is, is the way it should be, not full justification, so you have a ragged right margin like I have on this slide. Plurals and possessives. The apostrophe should only be used for possessives and contractions. And because we're not going to be using contractions very much, we probably shouldn't even have that there very much. But if you do use an apostrophe, it should be there because you're using it for a possessive. It shouldn't be used to make plurals. So if I'm talking about the 1960s, I don't put 1960 apostrophe S. I just write an S after the 1960. If I'm talking about something that's like an acronym like IAT and I'm talking about multiple of them, I can just add an S to it. And same with brain regions. I wouldn't put brain region apostrophe S. Try not to emphasize the author so much. This is sort of a more advanced writing technique in the sense that a lot of people want to go ahead and just say, these authors did this study, these authors concluded that. So the kind of way that a lot of people would write something is like Baumeister and Leary, 1989, conducted a study on self-regulation that demonstrated that our ability to regulate is dependent on how tired we are. In this study, participants, instead of just emphasizing it's Baumeister and Leary, instead perhaps what you want to do is just talk about the evidence. So a better way, I think a more effective way of writing is to say our ability to self-regulate is dependent on how tired we are. So I'm getting out the fact, the thing that's really my important thing I want to talk about here. And then I put brackets, Baumeister and Leary rather than making them the noun of the sentence like you see in the previous example. Try to have at least three sentences per paragraph. I often see par paragraphs that are only one or two sentences long. To double check if you have a short paragraph, there should be at least three sentences there. The only differences that matter are already significant. So the point here is that you shouldn't use the phrase significant differences. Um, what I'd rather have you do if you know that the research found a significant effect or whatever it was, is just to say what the effect was or what the difference was. So a bad way of writing this would be the researchers found significant differences on the measure between men and women. A better way to say that is just that men and women differed on this measure. Because if it's not a significant difference, then they don't differ on the measure. Some other notes. These have to do with lots of little teeny bits, but again, recommend that you go and actually look at your own copy of the publication manual. Numbers less than 10 are spelled out, whereas numbers that are 10 and higher are expressed numerically. There are exceptions, like starting a sentence with a number is spelled out, range statements, referring to a unit of measurement, numerals for dates and times, and so on, and when you have hyphenated expressions. EG versus IE. This is one of those ones that a lot of people get confused on. Keep in mind that EG stands for in Latin, for example, and IE stands for that is. So when you're using these, um, make sure you're using EG properly, that you're talking about it for an example. And the IE really means that is when you're going ahead and putting it in other words. And when you're not writing these things in brackets, you should actually write out the words for example, and that is. So you should only find EG and IE when they are being used in a a bracketed situation. You should also always use a comment after each of them. So for instance, you can see here I have bracket EG comma a red shirt or IE comma he failed to understand. And notice too that I put a full stop after the E and the G and a full stop after the I and the E because those are actually um, abbreviations and they're abbreviated uh, for both the E and the G and both for the I and the E so they both need a full stop after each. Again, active voice versus the passive voice. Common mistake, always trying to get people to write in the active voice. When you're in brackets, you wanna use the shortened version of verses and put VS full stop. And be sure, again, it's an abbreviation, so you put a full stop. Versus when it's outside the bracket. So when you're writing a sentence and you're saying uh, light versus sound, and you're not in brackets, and you would actually write out the word versus. This thing, by the way, about full stops in abbreviations, I think this is like a British uh, and even Australian practice that they just sort of drop off the full stops all the time. And again, keep in mind that we're talking about APA styles from the American Psychological Association. They are expecting that you properly abbreviate using full stops. There shouldn't be any shortage on your computer of the full stop button. Use full stops as much as you can. Data are versus analysis is. So data are always plural, so they have a plural verb that follows them. Analysis, with an I-S, not analyses. Analysis is a singular noun, so it has a singular verb. And a little final note here I have is to develop 
a relationship with someone who can proofread your work. This one, um, these are just some other little picadillos I have. On the left, I have things that you shouldn't use and instead you should use. So for instance, don't use since when you're not referring to the passage of time. When you're using since, usually you're talking about something like, since I didn't bring my packages with me, what you really mean is because I didn't bring my packages with me. So if it's since should only be really used for a passage of time and then use because instead. Similarly, like when you're using while or whilst, um, when you're not referring to the passage of time, it should be whereas or although. So while and whilst whilst should only happen when you're talking about two things occurring at the same time. And if you're not, you're just going ahead and making an argument about another argument, then it should be whereas or although. Interestingly, on this next one example, I see this quite a bit, and I'm not sure where. You can see that here the person's put a comma after the surname, Simonson, then et al. And notice there's no full stop after the all, even though it's an abbreviation. And then they put the year. It should be no comma before the et al, because et al basically means and the rest. So it should be Simonson and the rest, full stop, after the et al, comma, 2005. So you can see that on the right. Welsh and colleagues, this is again sort of a bad practice that some people are beginning into. Don't say and colleagues, it should be at all. So it's Welsh at all. So you're, uh, you would only use Welsh and colleagues if you're trying to talk about this group of people maybe who regularly, Welsh and his colleagues are regularly working on this topic over the last decade, that's fine. But if you're specifically talking about an article that Welsh at all wrote, you should use at all, not and colleagues. There's data is again, that it's a plural, data are. And instead of using the, the wordy phrase in order to, you can usually reduce that to to. No matter what, you should get yourself a copy of the APA publication manual. There's many different versions of it. There's even a briefer version of the APA manual that's really nice and wire bound. It's kind of cheap, I think. It's only like in the $20 to $30 range. It's much better to actually have the publication manual in hand rather than looking it up on the web every time you have a question. Even the library will have usually um, a handout interpreting the APA publication manual. None of these is as good as having the actual publication manual. I've joked about this over the years. It's kind of like having different religious groups interpreting the Bible by their own religion and then telling you what you're supposed to believe. But the actual book is right there, the publication manual. You don't need to have an intermediary um, helping you figure out what these things are. If you have your own copy, you can look right up and know definitively what the answer is. It's a very clearly written, easily uh, accessed book. So. That's all I have 